My name is Kyle Mack. I'm one of the lay elders here at the Oaks. Um, I am battling a bit of a cold, so if I'm clearing my throat or taking sips of water from the water bottle, please excuse me in that. Um, I am double-dosed on DayQuil at this point, and I've had three cups of coffee, so I think I'm ready to go. Um, so I'm quite confident that I'll get through. Um, but if I collapse afterwards, um, please call paramedics. Um, uh, if we have not yet had a chance to meet, I'd love to meet with you after today's gathering. The passage that we'll be examining this morning will be James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. In the bulletin, it says we're going to 12, but we're going to stop at 11 this morning. If you do not have a copy of God's Word, we would love to be able to give you a Bible as a gift from us to you. Um, you can pick up a Bible at one of the two tables out in our lobby area after today's gathering. And for your convenience, we will also post all of our scripture readings on the screen uh, behind me. So let us begin by reading from God's Word. Once again, we are in the book of James, chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 11, 7. God's Word reads, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being a Lord full of compassion and mercy, abounding in patience and steadfast love. Please prepare our hearts and our minds as we examine your words studiously this morning. Help us to clearly understand your instruction. Where we must be convicted, help us to be convicted. Where we must seek repentance, help us to be repentant. And where our souls desperately need encouragement, please let your word encourage us this morning. But most of all, conform us to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. And it is by his name that we pray. Amen. On October 3rd, 1832, Carolina Sandell was born in Freudred, Sweden. Fondly referred to as Lena, she shared a special bond with her father, a highly regarded Lutheran pastor. As a young girl, Lena would spend hours in her father's study playing at his feet as he continued to diligently craft his sermons. With time, her affections for God's word and her knowledge of it deepened. She eagerly listened to her father practicing his messages aloud in preparation for Sunday services at their church. Lena possessed a gift, a gift for writing and composing poetic lines that captured profound biblical truths. In the summer of 1858, 26-year-old Lena accompanied her father on a ferry ride across Lake Vatern. The refreshing Swedish summer breeze and the sunlit outer deck created a picturesque scene as Lena and her father admired the view. Tragically, the serene moment was shattered when the ship suddenly jolted and Lena witnessed her father being thrown overboard. He drowned before a rescue attempt could even be made leaving Lena heartbroken and forever changed by the traumatic event. The main point for today's message is our faith empowers us to endure all circumstances and difficulties with patience, forbearing one another, and trusting in God's providences. Today's passage immediately follows James's admonishment of the rich for their oppressive treatment of the poor. He has condemned the deeds of the rich and warned them of their pending judgment, which they will receive from God. So James has addressed the persecutors 
And now in this passage, he's going to turn his attention towards the persecuted. Those who he referred to as righteous in verse 6. This economic exploitation from the upper class leading to devastating poverty in the majority lower class is not the only hardship that the early church is enduring. James is writing to a church experiencing persecution from political and religious leaders that maintain control through corruption and brutality. On top of that, these same Christians were also currently experiencing a lack of vital resources as a result of widespread famine. To summarize, the first century Messianic Jews encountered a series of hardships, including oppression, persecution, and devastating natural disasters. In essence, the early Christian church faced significant adversity from multiple fronts. In the midst of these circumstances, James calls his brothers and sisters throughout the entire Christian community to be patient with two, two primary areas of focus in our text. First, patience, patient forbearance with others. Second, steadfastness, trusting in God's timing. See, there's a difference between waiting and being patient. Mark Brogop, in his book, Waiting Isn't a Waste, thank you, Jimmy, for the suggestion in the book there, um, he defines waiting as a gap in our lives that begins when we eagerly anticipate someone or something. We can wait patiently or impatiently within that gap. The way we wait actually reveals where we place our hope. John Piper, in his book Future Grace, states, Impatience is a form of unbelief. It's what we begin to feel when we start to doubt the wisdom of God's timing or the goodness of God's guidance. <clears throat> it springs up in our hearts when our plan is interrupted or shattered. It may be prompted by a long wait in a checkout line or a sudden blow that knocks out half our dreams. The opposite of impatience is not a glib denial of loss. It's a deepening, ripening, peaceful willingness to wait for God in the unplanned place of obedience and to walk with God at the unplanned pace of obedience, to wait in his place and to go at his pace. Perhaps waiting is most difficult as we experience uncertainty, untimely delays, disappointment, pain, and that feeling of powerlessness. Caleb Whitty this morning, in our time uh, before our service in the Quip Hour, he talked a lot about how our world has made us really bad at waiting. Our world caters to our desire for instant gratification. Current studies indicate that our attention spans are shrinking and our tendency toward impulsivity is growing. Our internal timers are severely out of balance. But... Our lives are still full of uncertainty and times of unwanted waiting. Our careers, singleness, marriage, pregnancy, health, relationships, any form of conflict, it forces us into these gaps of life. Perhaps you're in a season of waiting in your career right now. Some of us have just recently been passed up for a promotion or somehow a dream opportunity passed us by. Somehow our career pathway has been impeded upon. Many of our church family are in a season of preparation for a future career, jumping through hoops, enduring countless hours of study, being pushed to their mental and physical limits. I just spoke recently with two different members of our church family who are in the midst of experiencing a setback in their career. Their licensing examination results came in, and they didn't quite make the cut this time, leading to further delays and more study time. Perhaps you're in a season of waiting within your singleness or marriage or some other relationship. Some of you may be longing for a spouse, but in faithfulness are waiting for God to provide you with someone who fulfills his suitable standards. Others may have been blessed 
with a spouse. But that blessing feels more like a burden in this current season of life. In God's providence, you and your spouse are struggling through how to see eye to eye on something right now. Maybe it's in finances, how to discipline or raise your children, <clears throat> how to spend your free time, how to pursue each other in affection. Or maybe you're figuring out how to deal with a disappointment or a sin that you felt from your spouse. Perhaps you're enduring a season of waiting as it relates to a relationship with one of your children, a family member, a church member, a coworker, a friend. See, the reality is, is just like the early Christians, we're experiencing seasons of waiting in multiple areas of our lives simultaneously. So then it begs the question, why did God create a world where we have to wait? Well, waiting like no other force in our lives brings us to a critical realization. We do not ultimately have control over our lives. While we oftentimes have varying levels of influence, we most certainly do not have ultimate control. Mark Brogop, once again, proposes that when faced with this unwanted waiting, we typically err in our response in three primary ways. Anger, anxiety, or apathy. Anger, <clears throat> that is our outward attempt to force change. Anxiety is our inward attempt to force change. Let's think about anxiety for just a minute here. Anxiety can be exhausting and debilitating. Rather than learning to wait on God, we try to think our way out of our limitations. This leads to despair or an identity crisis. And then apathy. Apathy is the decision that the people involved or the situation at hand simply doesn't matter. In the grand scheme of things, what's the point? Who really cares? If anger demands action and anxiety wants to think, apathy just stops caring. The faithful response to unwanted waiting is a heart of patience. James uses two different terms to describe this concept of patience in these five verses. Wherever we see the word patient in our translations, uh, that most literally means to delay our reactivity. So it's a prohibition. It's saying, don't do this thing right away. Don't, don't be impulsive. Don't react right away. Pause on our impulse. It specifically has a connotation of delaying those destructive and vengeful impulses that arise when we've been mistreated or we sense injustice. However, James uses this term very broadly within the context. So whenever we face any form of delay or unwanted circumstance, he says, pause, delay. And wherever we see the word steadfastness in our translations, James' uh, word choice connotes the concept of endurance as opposed to a prohibition. He's saying, do something. And that term focuses more on setting our hearts toward a specific direction, like looking out towards something and not letting anything else move us from our attention, maintaining that focus in the midst of the adversity. So we can see two practical outworkings from this. Patience requires holding back from acting on impulse, and patience requires us to remain focused on what we believe rather than the circumstances we face. So with that, let's take a look more closely at the passage at hand to understand the source of our ability to remain patient. In verses 7 and 8, James is going to focus on the call to be patient. In verse 9, he will prohibit a specific, a specific way we often exhibit impatience, even in the midst of trying to be patient. And then in verse 10 and 11, we will, he will give us two direct examples of helpful mindsets that enable us to endure seasons or even lifetimes of waiting. So first, we see a call to patience in verses 7 and 8. In these first few phrases, James is imploring his brothers and sisters to be patient in the gap between their current circumstances and the awaited judgment of their oppressors. In essence, he is asking the believers to not look at their current situation and instead look at what they know to be true about God. 
perhaps it's helpful to think about the way Tim Keller explains this. He once said, if you are a secular person, you have no idea where you will be in a million years from now, except possibly you'll be nothing but molecules spread out throughout the universe. And if you are a member of any other religion, you don't know really either. You have no idea whether in the end you're going to live up to the standards set before you. You might be feeling as though right now, if I died, I could go to heaven, but you can't say for sure, I'll keep it up. A Christian is absolutely assured and convinced in a way that no other person is in the glory and beauty that is awaiting us in our future. A Christian is galvanized by the thought of the future. If you obey God like most people do because you want prayers answered and you want a comfortable life, you are not living the life of Christian faith. Keller lands on a most critical aspect of the Christian faith. The Christian faith does not obey God in order to get from God what we desire. The Christian faith is one that lives through the gaps of life, difficulty, trials, hardships, because we already have what we desire. James specifically refers to the coming of the Lord as an event to look forward to in our waiting. If we've been in Christian circles long enough, we might quickly read these words and gloss over them. But let us be reminded of the radical and wild nature of this claim. This small phrase is alluding to just one part of a larger set of interrelated beliefs, which we as believers refer to as our confessions of faith. Throughout various times in church history, Controversy has forced the church to produce clear and concise creeds which serve to articulate orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is just a really big term for the correct understanding and knowledge of what we are called to believe as Christians according to the Bible. The Nicene Creed was the result of the Council of Nicaea in A.D. 325. All the way back then, it still serves as a clear and concise confession of faith as it relates to what a Christian is called to believe about the Trinity, our triune God. While James's teaching certainly upholds the complete confession, he's specifically referring to one aspect in particular here in verses 7 and 8, and that is Christ's second coming. The Nicene Creed offers the following explanation of this belief. We believe that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. This belief is considered foolish and silly to the rest of the world, kind of like a fairy tale. I mean, they can, they can get, like, the baby Jesus born that comes and dies, but this part of our faith, it, it, it kind of seems a little weird to the rest of the world. Other detractors see it as dangerous poison that plagues cultures and allows the manipulation of humankind because there's power. If we look at this and we believe it and we look forward to it, it changes how we endure the difficulties of life right now. C.S. Lewis wrote this about the doctrine of the second coming. He said, The second coming is deeply uncongenial to the whole evolutionary or developmental character of modern thought. We have been taught to think of the world as something that grows slowly towards perfection, something that progresses or evolves. Christian apocalyptic offers us no such hope. The knowledge and belief in the second coming transforms our understanding of how to wait with patience. As Alistair Begg tried to exposit this particular passage, he sees that James appeals to the Lord's return as the answer to the question that burns within us all when we are forced into a season of unwanted waiting. He says that whenever we're forced into that unwanted waiting, we ask the question, why isn't God doing something? Alistair Begg says that James, in this passage, is saying God has done something and God will do something, therefore God is doing something. Paul then refers to patience as, or Paul, sorry, refers to patience as a fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. I think James extends this theme with the analogy of a farmer who waits patiently for a fruitful harvest. In this analogy, James is not referring to the corrupt, commercialized enterprise he denounced in verse 4, 
but instead he's giving us the example of local, single-family sustenance farming. See, in the Palestinian climate, the growing seasons are different from ours. Crops are planted in the fall, and then they're harvested in the spring. This occurs in alignment with two distinct times of higher levels of precipitation. And it kind of follows in line with this passage we're looking at here with the early and the late rains. If predicted correctly, farmers will plant their seeds right before the first rainy time. The seeds will then germinate and grow, being sustained by small levels of precipitation throughout their growth cycle and with the care of the farmer. In the spring, the farmer longingly waits for the second rainy time. This final allotment of water will cause the plants to grow rapidly, producing a harvest almost five times more abundant than what they would have been otherwise. Remember, James and his people have just experienced famine. The people know this reality all too well, that there is always a strong temptation to harvest early. In the midst of devastating hunger or worthy, worry as to whether the second rains will even come this year, families might choose to harvest early and suffer the consequences. Those who wait would yield the benefit of their patience. In verse 8, James transitions from his analogy back into practical teaching. The phrase, establish your hearts, is an idiom. It refers here to an inner steadiness, standing firm or taking courage, don't lose heart, keep your hopes high, or strengthen your hearts. The admonition to establish or strengthen your heart, it stands in strong contrast to those who have fattened their hearts earlier expressed in verse 5. The harvest we look forward to as we wait with strong hearts is the coming of the Lord. James kindles our motivation right here in verse 8 by reminding the leader that the coming of the Lord is at hand. This implication focuses not so much on looking toward the immediacy of Christ's return, but more so on the eminence of the Lord's return. James is pulling out two specific applications from his agricultural analogy. See, first, farmers do not need to know the exact time of the rains. They just need to remain focused on knowing that the rainy time is coming before they harvest. And if not ready, farmers will miss the narrow window of prime harvesting right after the second rains. The conditions of the field, the health of the crops, and the tools for harvest all must be eminently ready for when the time comes. Just as the task of the farmer is to be ready for when the rains do come, we need to live our lives as if Christ may return at any moment. This is a theme consistent with Christ's own teaching regarding his second coming. You can see this all over the, uh, the, the Gospels as Christ speaks. Uh, one such example is Luke 21, 34 through 36, where Christ says, but watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down by the cares of this life. And that day come upon you suddenly like a trap, for it will come upon all who dwell in the face of the whole earth. So next, after our command to patience, James moves on to a warning against grumbling in verse 9. In verse 9, there's a noticeable shift his attention now focuses on our relationships with our fellow brothers and sisters as opposed to our oppressors. We are, when we are forced to wait, we often grumble. Even as we establish our hearts, our hearts vacillate between faithfulness and unbelief. In Exodus, we see this vividly in the way that the Israelites grumble against God throughout their wilderness journey, leading to repeated warnings, corrections, and judgment from God. According to Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 2, the Israelites' journey from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea during the Exodus, that, that length, it really should have maybe only taken about 11 days to complete that journey. However, the Israelites wander in the wilderness for 40 years before entering the Promised Land. This, primary, this is primarily due to their lack of faith. James, however, is specifically prohibiting grumbling against one another as opposed to grumbling against God. That's because the pressure that leads uh, to his call for patience also creates internal tension 
And it is a sad tendency for us to speak in anger and haste when we're under pressure. James indicates the pressure we experience and how it can quickly be vented outwardly to those around us by way of displaced frustrations, complaining, or blaming. When we are forced to wait in the gaps of life, we often speak harshly against family and friends when we feel the pressure or sleeplessness or oppression of that waiting. We vent our tensions on those who we love, spreading our anxiety and our anger like a virus or an infection. We bicker against each other when it's actually somebody else who has wronged us. And we shift accountability for our lack of patience upon someone else or something else. Well, it is important for us to recognize that James here talks about the judge is at the door and don't be judged. He definitely is the, the same Lord who is coming to relieve the world of its injustices is also coming as a judge. It's also important for us to remember that we won't face God's ultimate judgment as believers. We won't face his wrath, that is, in judgment. But we will face God's assessment of every word and every deed. For example, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, Christ says, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. If venting under pressure is the toxin, humility is the antidote. Humility is characterized by a genuine recognition of one's limitations, a selfless attitude, a compassionate disposition towards others, and a willingness to submit. Understanding God's greatness and embracing our imperfections is the seed that grows humility. It's interesting how you can parallel James' teaching here and Paul's teaching in Philippians. In the face of adversity, Paul calls the Philippians to stand firm and be humble. And Paul summarizes this call for humility when he says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. James concludes his instruction on patience with shifting to two examples in verses 10 and 11, the prophets and Job. <clears throat> in both cases, we're not looking at examples of perfection, but instead, we are looking at two examples of people who, through the full arc of their life story, got it right. To best illustrate this, I'm going to give you a little story from my past. The first day of fifth grade at Edwin H. Green School was momentous, as it marked the convergence of students from all four elementary schools in our district. The excitement of forming new friendships was palpable, especially when I met JT, short for James Thomas, an effortlessly cool student with whom I shared a middle name. And back in those days, that was enough reason to form this unbreakable bond. As we settled into our homerooms, our classroom teacher announced that she would take role using our legal names. However, if we uh, go by a nickname instead, we can politely share that with her and the rest of the class. So I saw this as the perfect opportunity to emulate my newfound friend. So when my name was called, Kyle Mack, I confidently declared my new moniker, KT, short for Kyle Thomas. From that moment on, I introduced myself to everyone as KT, convinced I had found my new identity. And my newfound confidence, it carried me all the way through the entire school day until music class. When the teacher called out Kyle Mack, I eagerly corrected her, asserting my chosen nickname. And she then paused and with a slight head tilt said, Kyle, are you sure you want to go by Katie? As you can imagine, in that instant, the weight of my blunder crashed down upon my fifth grade soul. <laughs> Realizing that I had spent the entire day establishing myself as KT to hundreds of students and all of my new teachers, I swiftly backpedaled and insisted that Kyle was, in fact, my preferred name. 
I raced to my academic wing as soon as the bell rang, desperate to inform all my new teachers and all the students that were still remaining that I go by Kyle and not Katie. So my, my Katie story serves as a funny and humbling anecdote to remind us that our mistakes do not necessarily and ultimately determine the full arc of our story. I did not have to live the rest of my life adhering to the moniker that I determined for myself based upon a silly mistake that I made upon impulse on the first day of fifth grade. While my friends and my kids will most certainly call me Katie for a week or two, uh, after sharing this story today, my name is and will continue to be Kyle. Jimmy, you can call me Katie whenever you'd like. I know you're, you're yeah, yeah, yeah. Likewise, the prophets in Job serve as examples of those who ultimately got it right. The prophets, they represent endurance through persecution as a result of holding our faith. And Job, he represents endurance through life's calamities and hardships even when those hardships don't really seem to have any reason to them. So let's look at the prophets. James emphasizes a, a critical characteristic about these prophets as he, excites them, as he cites them as examples. They spoke in the name of the Lord. This differentiates them from false prophets who diluted their message to appease people rather than carry the message of God's true word. Prophets like Elijah... Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, and Amos, they all encountered resistance when conveying God's warnings and corrections. Israel's leaders often met their prophecies with hostility and disbelief. Still, these faithful prophets, they persevered in their mission to denounce covenant infidelity and expose evil deeds, even if they didn't witness their foretold judgments. The people... The people continued to demand signs and miracles, but regardless of what the prophets performed, their messages were often dismissed. We remember these prophets as those who remain steadfast in proclaiming God's word nonetheless. Not only are they upheld as strong examples of endurance, they also are upheld as examples of blessed saints. Do you see that in the passage here? He calls them blessed. Blessedness is best understood in Jesus' teaching in the Beatitudes found in Matthew chapter 5. Each blessing describes God's special favor towards those whose hearts find their joy and rest in God alone. No other source that would vie for affections but God alone. These blessings come in multiple formats. Preservations, deliverances, satisfaction in the moments when most needed, and in an inheritance to come. Now let's look at Job. When we read the biblical account of Job, we once again read of a man that was not always perfect, but he certainly was patient and he persevered. Think about it. He lost his wealth. He lost his livelihood. It was decimated. His children perished. His wife repeatedly tells him to reject God and die. And his friends unfairly accuse him of all sorts of wrongdoing. In response to each challenge, Job never charged God with wrongdoing or rejected God for his circumstances. Just as in the previous example given, Job not only serves as an example of a person of faith who endured, but his story also points to the greater faithfulness of God. Because Job did lack one thing as he endured the gaps of life patiently. He lacked humility. You can see that in the way he questions God. When he says, why are you doing this? What is your purpose in all of this? Haven't I done everything good in your sight? God responds graciously and compassionately to Job. He is very, very clear with Job, but he is compassionate because he gives him a response. See, God responds to Job's questioning by expressing the number of ways that Job is incapable of knowing what God knows. God ultimately uses Job's circumstances as a blessing for Job. Job believed more in his, that his behavior was the primary purpose for God's favor. So Job's life, it's restored. He receives greater intimacy with God and a deeper glimpse of God's glory through those circumstances. So through Job's bitter providences, 
God's compassion and mercy is on full display in his life as the final chapter comes to a close. So each of these examples give us two different mindsets. Mindset number one, as we hear and proclaim God's very word over our lives, even when the world around us opposes it, we can trust that God will preserve, God will deliver, and God will satisfy us in the margins. Mindset number two, through our bitter providences, God's compassion and mercy will be on full display. Praise the Lord. So Hebrews 4, 16. I, I thought at this point I was done with my sermon, and then on Friday in my devotional, listen, reading something through John Piper, and I was like, I missed a point. So this one's for free. <laughs> Hebrews 4, 16 assures us that we can confidently approach God's throne of grace to receive well-timed help. When we look at that passage, while traditional translations focus on receiving mercy and finding grace during our times of need, a more literal inter interpretation highlights the promise of God's perfectly timed assistance. God decides when we need it. As we face uncertainties in life, prayer becomes the bridge that connects our present with God's future grace, ensuring we receive the help we need precisely when we need it. By understanding God's sovereign control over time, we can trust in his perfect timing. His perspective on time is vastly different than ours. A thousand years to him are but a day. God's authority extends from orchestrating the rise and fall of nations to guiding our personal journeys. Our times are in his hands. And he promises that future grace will arrive exactly when it is best for us. So as we complete our study of James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11, let's look back at the rest of the story regarding Carolina Sandell's life. Lena remained unwavering in her sorrow, drawing solace from written reflections on God's promises in his word as she grappled with the loss of her father. Although she had penned a few hymns prior to this tragedy, her writing flourished through the difficulty resulting in a, an abundance of beautiful songs. Over the course of her lifetime, Lena composed 650 hymns. Remarkably, God used her heartfelt creations to help fuel a powerful, decades-long revival that swept across Scandinavia, and it spread throughout various parts of the globe. Among her extensive collection of cherished works, is the hymn she wrote shortly after her father's, father's tragic death, Day by Day. It stands out as one of the most well-known and beloved pieces that she written. The third and final verse of Day by Day poignantly encapsulates Lena's enduring faith and trust in God's providence. Help me then in every tribulation, so to trust thy promises, O Lord that I lose not faith's sweet consolation offered me within thy holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meeting, ere er to take as from a father's hand, one by one the days, the moments fleeting, till with Christ the Lord I stand. Let us pray.